Welcome and thank you for joining me for the 2019-2020 EMS protocol updates. Every medical command physician in the state of Pennsylvania is required to go through the updates in order to be registered as a medical command physician. It is our job to know the EMS protocols and the updates as they occur. This is very important so that we may give the appropriate medical command orders over the radio. This protocol update is also required for initial and re-registration of your medical command certification. This protocol update is a condensed version of the one hosted on the state LMS system. The original state update lecture is designed for providers, and I have been allowed to condense that lecture down to what is important for us as medical command physicians. After you complete this update, you will be able to go into the state system and begin your medical command registration or read registration. Please refer to the Word document sent out on the step-by-step -step process to complete your registration. You will answer yes to the question pertaining to completing the update lecture. You will also email Jason Smith at the Eastern PA EMS Council that you have completed your registration and the protocol updates so that he may authorize you in the system. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact myself or Jason, and we will be happy to help you through the process. Protocols are updated every two years. The last update was in September of 2019. This was both for PLS protocols as well as ALS protocols. Recommendations for new protocols and revisions have just been submitted for the 2021 version which should be set to come out in September of next year. We will begin with the BLS protocols. If you'd like to review a hard copy of the protocols, you can download a version on the Eastern PA EMS website, off of the Pennsylvania Department of Health Bureau of EMS website. You can do a Google search for Pennsylvania statewide BLS protocols, or I'd be happy to send you a PDF version. These BLS protocols are applicable to not only BLS providers, but also ALS providers. In 2019, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration updated their national scope of practice model. Pennsylvania is one of the first states to change our state EMS scope of practice to match this new model. The scope of practice is defined by what an EMS provider is trained to do, certified to do, permitted to do by the state, and credential to do by the EMS agency and its medical director. Altering the Pennsylvania scope of practice to be consistent with this national document will ensure more consistency among EMS providers and what they learn in educational institutes, what they are tested on by the National Registry of EMTs, and the skills they are permitted to do here in Pennsylvania. While that is good for EMS providers, current certified providers are responsible for obtaining the additional education needed to fill the gaps between their previous training and the updated Pennsylvania scope of practice. Statewide protocols are integrated with the Pennsylvania EMS scope of practice, the EMS medication list, and the EMS required equipment list. These corresponding documents are published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin and then posted on the Bureau of the EMS website. EMS providers are expected to deliver care within the scope of practice of their level of EMS certification. The BLS protocols not only apply to BLS providers, but also to advanced EMTs, as well as ALS or paramedic providers. The BLS protocols generally apply to emergency medical responders, formerly known as first responders, but EMR should be aware of the sections of the BLS protocols that apply only to EMTs So what's new in the BLS protocols? Well, first is an algorithm for the appropriate transport of children and use of appropriate restraining devices, the ground transport requirements of stroke patients and the timing of bypassing primary stroke centers to go to a thrombectomy capable or comprehensive stroke center, the change in the oxygenation ventilation rates for infants and children, and some updates on cardiac arrest management. There were two optional BLS protocols introduced in the current updates. The first protocol involves 12 lead application and transmission of those 12 leads to a cath capable facility. The idea is to decrease door to balloon times. And this is especially important in areas of Pennsylvania that don't have a lot of ALS coverage and rely heavily on their BLS providers. 
The second optional protocol involves the use of nebulized bronchodilators, including albuterol, atrovent, and duodenums. Now, it's important to keep in mind that in order for an agency to use these optional protocols, additional education must be provided and validation must be confirmed by their medical director. And finally, there's two new resources in the appendix of the protocols. The first is Appendix H, which really is an oxygen supply graph that helps providers determine if they have enough adequate oxygen for interfacility transport to patients who are requiring oxygen. The other reviews a standardized method of providing a verbal EMS handoff report and the use of the transfer of care form that must be left behind after each patient encounter. A new algorithm has been added to the guideline for the transportation of children in ground ambulances. This algorithm was added to provide a clear resource for identifying the appropriate methods of transport for children with and without injuries. Additionally, it is no longer appropriate to transport a child under the age of 15 in the passenger seat of an ambulance, as this may become a distraction for the driver. The algorithm and guideline also recommends the appropriate and approved restraining devices for children while they're being transported. The Joint Commission has added a new level of stroke center designation and the patient designation protocol, as well as the suspected stroke protocol, have been updated to include these thrombectomy capable stroke centers as an appropriate destination for patients with suspected stroke especially those with large vessel occlusions that may require interventional treatment to remove an occluding clot. Like comprehensive stroke centers, ambulances may bypass closer facilities to transport a patient with a suspected large vessel occlusion if they can arrive at that thrombectomy capable stroke center within 45 minutes. For use while assisting ALS by ventilating a patient through an advanced airway, like an endotracheal tube, King LT or eye gel, the protocol has simplified the rate of ventilation for infants and children down to 12 to 20 breaths per minute or ventilation every three to five seconds. This is consistent with the current PALS guidelines and it removes the complexity of recommending a separate rate for infants. Where it is believed that a BLS service may be able to obtain and transmit 12 lead EKGs for patients suspected of having a myocardial infarction well before an ALS agency is available or may be able to transmit, BLS agencies may obtain the equipment, training, and skill to perform these 12 leads. This protocol has significant system requirements that must be in place before an EMT can do the skill. This is because every 12 lead obtained must be transmitted to a receiving center interpreted by a physician in real time. Therefore, any process that includes the skill done by EMTs must also have the structure and system processes in place for the skill to add value to patient care by decreasing the time to arrival in a cardiac cath lab. Agencies that wish to incorporate this skill at the EMT level must ensure separate training and oversight by the EMS agency medical director and must meet the other system requirements within this protocol before EMTs may obtain 12 lead EKGs. CARES, or the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival, is a national registry of EMS patients and cardiac arrests. In 2018, more Pennsylvania EMS agencies submitted cardiac arrest cases to CARES than ever before. By submitting all of their cardiac arrest cases to CARES, EMS agencies can compare their cardiac arrest demographics, treatments, and survival with not only regional and state, but also national outcomes. All BLS and ALS agencies in Pennsylvania are encouraged to participate in CARES. CARES reports help EMS agencies understand their care and improve their survival rates. Pennsylvania has a mix of EMS agencies with very high survival rates that have been sustained over years, with some that have very low survival rates. By supporting CARES and submitting data, which is also supported by our Heart Institute here at LVHN, we can affect change to improve the system. A large emphasis has been placed on EMS agencies to strive to improve the high performance teamwork of their providers during CPR. High quality CPR is the most important factor in maximizing an agency's cardiac arrest survival. EMS agencies are encouraged to ensure that their providers work as a team to provide the highest quality CPR. 
Previous protocol changes have focused on optimal compressions. In this update, there is a concentration on optimal ventilation techniques during CPR. Pennsylvania protocols use continuous compressions rather than the 30 to 2 ratio used by some other programs. With use of a BVM, providers are encouraged to give one ventilation every 10 compressions using the two-person, two-thumbs-up technique. They encourage providers to time their ventilations with the upstroke of every 10th compression to take advantage of the negative intrathoracic pressure to draw the breath in, minimizing inflation of the stomach. Use of metronome, of which some cardiac monitors incorporate already, is encouraged to enhance effective compressions and timing. Recent studies of cardiac arrest outcomes show that EMS agencies with the highest survival rates spend the most time on scene and also do the most field termination or resuscitation. The old style of the scoop and swoop approach to cardiac arrest leads to death for most patients. And this is because providers are not concentrating on the highest quality of CPR. High quality CPR leads to the best perfusion of the heart and brain and therefore the highest rate of return of spontaneous circulation. Agencies with the highest survival concentrate on a treat on the X type process that provides high quality CPR where the patient lies until ROSC is obtained and then they concentrate on post ROSC care so they ultimately are transporting a stable patient and decreasing the chance of rearrest. Because the patient's chance of survival decreases dramatically when the patient is moved during CPR, BLS agencies are now encouraged to concentrate on high quality CPR and quick use of the AD rather than focusing on early packaging and transportation of the patient. If ALS is expected to arrive at the scene within 20 minutes, BLS services should treat the patient in place and wait for ALS arrival. The updates acknowledge that ECMO may help a subset of patients but is not available at the vast majority of hospitals. For agencies that are very close to a hospital that provides ECMO, the agency medical director may identify a subgroup of patients that should be packaged rapidly and transported to that ECMO center. Here at LBHN, we have a protocol for eCPR that has been laid out to the EMS community and includes those patients that meet identified criteria. To address the cost of epinephrine auto-injectors and to facilitate continued ability to provide this level of care for EMS agencies, the Department of Health has lowered the number of auto-injectors that must be carried by participating BLS services. The revised quantity is one adult dose and one pediatric dose. EMS agencies may elect to carry more doses, but are only required one dose for each patient population. In 2019, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration updated the National Scope of Practice model to include the skill of administering bronchodilators by nebulizer within the scope of practice for EMTs. Pennsylvania is the first state to have aligned our state scope of practice and statewide protocols with this new National Scope of Practice. So the skill is now on the EMT scope of practice in Pennsylvania. Initially, the skill is being added as an optional part of the statewide respiratory distress protocol. To carry nebulizer equipment and albuterol and ipitropium, a BLS service and its medical director must meet optional system requirements and must ensure that all of their EMTs are trained to do this skill. Services will be allowed to carry albuterol as well as ipitropium or duonems. EMTs are used to being able to assist a wheezing patient with their own MDI, but now they will have the option to use nebulizers. A separate education module that includes a hands-on session to master the skill of using a nebulizer and preparing the medication is required before an EMT does the skill with an agency. The EMS agency medical director and the agency must ensure the competency of their EMTs for the skill. The suspected stroke protocol has been updated to include the new accreditation level of thrombectomy capable stroke center. The Pennsylvania Department of Health posts the most up-to-date list of recognized stroke centers of all levels on the Bureau of EMS website listed here below. A standardized guide for the verbal handoff of care report to receiving facilities has been developed by a cooperative effort among the Pennsylvania Trauma Systems Foundation, the Pennsylvania Emergency Health Services Council, and the Pennsylvania Department of Health Bureau of EMS. The standardized handoff or transfer of care process is called DMIST. 
This slide demonstrates the DMS mnemonic. The report is designed to be brief and it should be completed within 15 to 30 seconds. The World Health Organization and patient safety organizations identify transfer of care as periods of high risk for medical errors. Five major healthcare organizations, including the American College of Emergency Physicians, the National Association of EMS Physicians, the National Association of EMTs, the National Association of State EMS Officials, and the Emergency Nurse Association, have a position statement related to transfer of care from EMS to the hospital. To avoid preventable medical error, this transfer of care should include a verbal report, a written report, and an opportunity for the receiving provider to ask questions. The DMIS process has been used by several trauma centers in Pennsylvania, and it is now recommended as a standard format for the verbal report of a patient information to the emergency department. While the DMIS process was initially developed around transfer of trauma patients to a trauma center, this process is equally valid for transferring information about patients with STEMI, stroke, or in fact, any other medical issue. If a patient is critically ill requiring an immediate intervention, like establishing an airway, the patient will be immediately transferred to the ED stretcher and the critical intervention will be done immediately. After that, the ED team leader will ask for the EMS timeout and the EMS provider will have 30 seconds of silence to give an uninterrupted DMIS verbal report. After the DMIS report, the ED team can ask any questions related to the report. In the vast majority of cases, the patient will be stable enough for a 30-second report before transferring the patient to the ED stretcher. In this case, upon arriving to the room and when the team is ready to accept the report, the ED team lead calls for a timeout for EMS. Our trauma team currently is calling this time the medic minute. The ED team lead can be a physician leader of a trauma or stroke team, or can be a nurse for a more routine one-on-one -on -one report during most EMS to ED transfers. The EMS provider then has an opportunity to give an uninterrupted DMIS report before the patient is transferred to the ED stretcher. Ideally, everyone should be paying attention to the EMS report, and both ED and EMS providers should avoid the temptation to be distracted starting the transfer process by activities such as unbuckling straps, moving the patient, or attaching EKG electrodes. After the short DMIS report, the patient is transferred to the ED stretcher and the EMS provider remains until hospital providers have asked any appropriate follow-up questions. It is important to understand that the DMS verbal report does not replace the need to provide a written report of the key information for patient handoff prior to EMS leaving the ED. While the full patient care report or PCR is also important, this PCR is usually not available to the healthcare providers in the ED to transfer critical information at the time of care. Therefore, the Pennsylvania Department of Health Transfer of Care form is used to transfer the key information that is required by EMS regulations. The DOH Transfer of Care form takes minimal time to complete, transfers key information to ED providers, can become proof of having transferred key information, and can serve as notes for the EMS provider when completing the complete PCR later. Pennsylvania statewide EMS protocols are updated at least every two years. The Bureau of EMS continually solicits for suggestions to improve these protocols, and they welcome your input for both significant changes, new protocols, removal of outdated information, or even correction of typos. The process for submitting suggestions is included on the online cover sheet to each protocol. They strive to have the most evidence-based protocols to provide patients in Pennsylvania with the best outcomes from their EMS care. That concludes the updates for the BLS protocols. If you have any questions about the BLS protocol updates, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Let's shift gears and review the 2019-2020 Pennsylvania ALS protocol updates. We will review the changes and additions to the 2019 version of the statewide ALS protocol which must be followed by all EMS providers above the level of an advanced EMT in the Commonwealth. So what's new in the ALS protocols? These protocols expand upon options for crystalloid solutions. There's a new protocol for the approach to the crashing patient. 
that attempts to prevent post-arrival respiratory or cardiac arrest in patients that are critically ill. There are updates to the approaches to cardiac arrest and CHF. Additionally, there is an option for the use of subdissociative doses of ketamine for pain relief with important system requirements that must be followed for an agency to be approved to use this protocol. We'll start by looking at IV solutions. Normal saline solution is referenced and used throughout these protocols. Normal saline has the advantage of being compatible with all EMS medications and is the solution of choice to treat and avoid hypotension and head trauma patients. Although differences in other isotonic solutions are probably not clinically significant at the volumes and duration of EMS care, other fluids are being added to the medication list to allow for preference of healthcare systems and options during fluid shortages. Lactated ringers and other balanced salt solutions may be carried as an option by an EMS agency if approved by the agency medical director. But it is up to the agency medical director to educate providers when another isotonic fluid is preferred by the medical director over a normal saline solution. These other solutions must be isotonic and hypertonic concentrations of any electrolyte that exceeds physiologic concentration may not be carried by an ALS service. The new statewide ALS protocols have included a protocol to approach the crashing patient or the patient in extremis. The protocol serves as a guide to the initial approach of the critically ill patient and encourages appropriate care before patient packaging, loading, or transport. During quality improvement reviews of their cardiac arrest care, Pittsburgh EMS identified instances of PARCA, or what they term post-arrival respiratory or cardiac arrest. These are cases where a critical patient is identified and while packaging and loading the patient with intent to start treatment in the ambulance, the patient develops respiratory or cardiac arrest. Pittsburgh EMS developed an approach to the crashing patient to recognize critically ill patients and intervene before loading the patient in the ambulance. The goal is to have early recognition of critically ill patients and to prevent deterioration by treating the conditions immediately. For most medical conditions, ALS providers have all the tools and treatments that emergency department would use initially. And providers are encouraged to deploy these interventions to prevent deterioration into cardiac arrest. The updates present a few cases to demonstrate the use of the protocol. In this scenario, EMS is dispatched to a 54-year-old female with severe respiratory distress. She has a history of COPD, hypertension, and asthma. Her GCS is 15, her pulse is 140, her respiratory rate is 48, and her oxygen saturation is 68%. The EMS team does not obtain a blood pressure or an EKG. Because the team realizes she is seriously ill, the crew quickly packages the patient and attempts to load her in the ambulance with intentions of doing advanced care in the familiar surroundings of the ambulance. The patient is most likely in respiratory failure. No blood pressure was documented and EKG monitoring and capnography were not applied. CPAP was initiated in a few minutes, which was a good decision but then the patient was ex extricated from the house without IV access or medical therapy and suffers cardiac arrest when she arrives in the ambulance. 60 minutes later, the patient arrives in the ED with CPR in progress and asystole on the EKG. Because a rapidly deteriorating trauma patient often requires care in an operating room to correct hemorrhagic shock, loading and transport should be the priority in a serious trauma patient. Therefore, crashing trauma patients are excluded from the protocol, and they should be loaded and transported while doing appropriate treatment. On the other hand, crashing patients without trauma are often in the medical categories of respiratory failure, shock, altered mental status, or cardiac complaints. While a small percentage of crashing patients will arrest in the first five minutes after patient contact, the majority will have a longer time interval in which to intervene. In a case series of over 60 cases collected over three years from the city of Pittsburgh EMS, the average time until cardiac arrest in these PARCA patients was 16 minutes. This time should allow for significant EMS clinical intervention to be accomplished. More worrisome is that when these crashing patients develop cardiac arrest, their survival rate is lower than the other cardiac arrest patients seen by the agency. Respiratory failure used to be the primary reason for deterioration, 
But since the use of CPAP in the pre-hospital setting, the majority of crash and patient cases are now patients who present with new onset of altered mental status or shock. In reviewing crash and patients in one series, clinical care omissions associated with these cases were the failure to obtain a full set of vital signs and initiated physiologic monitoring such as EKG and end tidal CO2. In addition to not measuring some critical vital signs, other errors seen with crashing patients are moving the patient to the ambulance instead of performing life-saving interventions at the point of patient contact. Those interventions include basic airway management, CPAP application, bag valve mask ventilation, IV access, and fluid administration. This slide highlights that there are many cases of patients in extremis where IV access or fluid resuscitation does not occur before cardiac arrest. By failing to provide immediate aggressive care, physiologic derangement will persist or further deteriorate. The crashing patient protocol focuses on the treatment of specific correctable causes of rapid deterioration, including hypovolemia, hypoxia and poor perfusion leading to lactic acidosis, potassium abnormalities, and hypothermia. You will recognize these as part of the HMTs of ACLS. The focus of the protocol is in preventing the metabolic deterioration before cardiac arrest, rather than trying to reverse these severe metabolic derangements after CPR is required. The protocol stresses that the load and go, or load and play thought process, which refers to moving to the ambulance first before beginning intervention, is not an acceptable strategy for seriously ill medical patients. Load and go is the right approach for trauma patients and patients with uncontrolled internal hemorrhage, but it can lead to worse outcomes for patients with respiratory failure, medical shock, including septic, cardiogenic, or hypovolemic, and for patients with cardiac issues. The load and play approach loses valuable time for interventions in the minutes where post-arrival respiratory or cardiac arrest may be prevented by rapid recognition and treatment. Some have differentiated between treating the patient at the scene and quickly loading for transport using the term stay and play versus scoop and swoop. The science supports treating patients with respiratory failure, medical shock, and cardiac arrest on scene aggressively rather than by rapid load and go. In the military and tactical situations, the scene is often dangerous and providers are encouraged to load the patient quickly to avoid treating on the X, where the X is the location of patient injury. In medical shock and cardiac arrest, it is clear that patients do better if we build our EMS system to specifically treat on the X. Non-traumatic shock is seen by EMS providers far more often than traumatic shock, in some cases up to 10 times more frequently. Despite this, it is not managed well in the field, with less than 50% of patients in one case series receiving IV access. Seymour showed that patients who received IV access in the field were more likely to also receive larger volumes of fluid during their ED care and tended to meet fluid goals of resuscitation more often. Seymour also showed that if IV fluids are given to patients in septic shock by EMS, then there is a 55% reduction in odds of death compared to similar patients that do not receive IV fluids by EMS. Furthermore, if a patient develops cardiac arrest from septic shock, CHF, or hypovolemia, the chance of a successful resuscitation is much lower than for patients that receive CPR for other causes. In discussing the results of Seymour studies, it is stated that timely pre-hospital interventions make a positive difference in sickest patients. And when seeking to optimize EMS systems to improve outcomes, the findings support a strategy which favors early, targeted, IV access, particularly among those with evidence of most severe illness. Therefore, in cases of medical shock, it is critical to begin resuscitation before the patient deteriorates to cardiac arrest, with the goal of reducing the number of cardiac arrest cases that are witnessed by EMS providers. And this treat on the X protocol emphasizes those points. The Crash and Patient Program was developed as a patient safety initiative at the City of Pittsburgh EMS, with the goal of addressing delayed critical interventions for medical patients, which included physiologic monitoring, management of ABC issues, obtaining vascular access, 
and providing maximum therapy based on patient complaints prior to moving the patient to the ambulance. The protocol update stresses that inadequate monitoring, airway management, IV access, and resuscitation with fluids or medication, and or delay of these interventions until after loading the patient into the ambulance, allows for harmful physiology to persist, worsening hypoxia, hypercarbia, hypotension, and acidosis while loading the patient is dangerous and invites cardiac arrest. The crash indication protocol creates an algorithm of care with time standards for accomplishing each intervention. There are expectations and actions bundled in the algorithm to be accomplished within 5, 10, 15, and 20 minutes. Let's take a quick look at those algorithms. So within the first five minutes, management of airway and respiratory issues should take precedence. If able to, the sitting up position is encouraged for adult patients in respiratory distress. This is due to the better breathing dynamics and fuller lung excursions in that position. For infants, the recommendation is a small towel roll behind the shoulders to improve airway position. Based on the respiratory status, Patients should be placed on high flow oxygen, CPAP, or assisted ventilations with positive pressure via a BVM. The two person, two thumbs up technique for BVM ventilation is recommended. There is an emphasis to have a low threshold for assisting ventilations with a BVM if the SAT is less than 90% on an IVA breather. If the EMS agency uses BVM devices with a PEEP valve, 10 centimeters water PEEP can be dialed into the BVM to further improve oxygenation. PEEP valves are being encouraged to use, and many services have switched their BVMs to devices that have PEEP valves built in. Also within those first five minutes, a full set of vitals should be noted, as well as full monitoring capabilities should be applied. Full monitoring includes an EKG, SpO2, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, and waveform and tidal CO2. After airway and breathing issues are addressed, the emphasis becomes that of shock management. If there's an arrhythmia causing poor perfusion, cardioversion or external pacing should be used to address the issue. IV or IO access should be obtained and fluid resuscitation should begin with 500 cc's of normal saline in a bolus form as long as the patient is not in CHF. For pediatric patients, fluid resuscitation is performed at 20 cc per kilogram or 10 cc per kilogram if cardiogenic shock is suspected. Reassessment and continued monitoring of vitals is encouraged to help guide further shock management. Reboluses of IV fluid is based on the response of the patient. Further arrhythmia management, including bradycardia, should be addressed in the setting of hypotension. Push dose pressures are encouraged in patients who continue to be hypotensive, altered, or unstable. If hypotension does not respond to fluid boluses, providers can consider adding a vasopressor beyond push dose by consulting a medical command physician. Continued reassessment of the patient's airway and respiratory state, as well as response to shock management should continue throughout the encounter. Once maximal therapy has been provided, it is safe to move to the ambulance. In this slide, you can see that the patients that were given push dose epinephrine significantly increased their systolic blood pressure. Using the crash indication strategy, the City of Pittsburgh EMS has significantly reduced the incidence of crashing patient cases that become cardiac arrests over the last several years. The numbers of these cases have almost been cut in half. Looking at the CARES database for 911 witness cardiac arrests, the national average has been around 12%. Pittsburgh EMS reduced their 911 witness cardiac arrests from 12.1% to 7.6% over three years using the crashing patient approach. The incidence of CPR cases witnessed by 911 providers in CARES occurring more than five minutes after EMS contact decreased from 9.7% to 5.7% over the same time frame. The system reduction of case incidents was driven by improving patient management and monitoring, basic airway management, obtaining IV access, and treating shock effectively. So in summary, critically ill patients must be managed at the point of patient contact to maximize outcomes and improve survival. 
This is the concept of the treat on the X. Applying monitoring, managing the airway and respiratory distress or failure, obtain vascular access, and provide maximal medical therapy prior to moving the patient to the ambulance has what made this protocol so effective. We'll now look at updates to the general cardiac arrest protocols. We'll review advanced airway preferences, uh, return to spontaneous circulation care, and updates on the ventilation rate. The updated protocol for cardiac arrest identifies the King LT, pictured above, and the eye gel, pictured below, as the airways that should be initially used during cardiac arrest. Endotracheal intubation should be reserved for patients that cannot be adequately ventilated with a King LT or an eye gel airway. If you've never seen these airways, they are considered supraglottic devices. The eye gel does not have a balloon, it's very similar to an LMA. After ROS following a cardiac arrest, EMS providers are encouraged not to package or transport the patient for at least 10 minutes due to increased risk of recurrence. Care should be focused on ensuring an adequate blood pressure, ventilation, and vital signs. During initial cardiac arrest management, ventilation should be provided through passive ventilation from chest compressions. If a bag valve mask is used to assist with ventilations, the rate should be 8 to 10 breaths per minute or one ventilation every 10 chest compressions. Chest compressions are encouraged not to be interrupted to ventilate, and the two thumbs up or two person technique is recommended. Under the newborn neonatal resuscitation protocol, epinephrine administration through the ET tube has been removed, as the literature really does not show that it's effective. For post-ROSC care, the target blood pressure should be a systolic blood pressure greater than 120 or a MAP greater than 80. For the asthma, COPD, or bronchospasm protocol, the dose of methylprednisolone has been decreased to allow providers to give 40 milligrams or the 125. There's an update for the congestive heart failure protocol. Added as an optional intervention is IV or IO nitroglycerin. An EMS agency medical director can improve the use of IV or IO nitroglycerin for patients that do not tolerate some lingual nitros. The use of nitroglycerin paste is also an optional way to administer the medication. Some recommendations include a mix of therapies or a recipe based on the specific patient and their condition. Under the narrow complex tachycardia protocol for both adults and pediatrics, the carotid massage is no longer an acceptable vagal technique to treat SVT. This has been removed from the national standard curriculum and so reflects in the protocols. Ketamine has been added to the musculoskeletal trauma protocol and the non-traumatic pain management protocol. Ketamine is an optional medication for EMS agencies and EMS providers above the level of an AEMT to use for pain management. The use of ketamine is approved through the EMS agency medical director and the regional EMS council. The agency medical director must oversee training and continuing education of EMS personnel in the use of ketamine. There is a 100% review of each use of ketamine by the EMS agency medical director. EMS providers are not permitted to administer ketamine for indications outside of specific indications within these protocols, even by a medical command order. After naloxone is given for an opioid overdose, under the altered level of consciousness protocol for adults, an ALS provider is able to release the patient to the care of the BLS provider if the patient is stable. You may be getting more command calls in reference to these decisions. For the stroke protocol, the time of onset has been increased to 24 hours. Additionally, the thrombectomy capable stroke centers have been added to the destination list. And finally, as a reminder, the Pennsylvania statewide EMS protocols are updated at least every two years. The Bureau of EMS continuously solicits for suggestions to improve the protocols and welcomes input for both significant changes, new protocols, removal of outdated information, or even correction of typos. The process for submitting suggestions is included in the online cover letter to each protocol. 
The Bureau strives to have the most evidence-based protocols to provide patients in Pennsylvania with the best outcomes for their EMS care. That concludes the review of the 2019-2020 BLS and ALS protocol updates. I thank you for completing this TLC module in order to keep up with your recertification as a medical command physician. If you have any questions about the protocols or how to complete your medical command recertification, please do not hesitate to contact me directly.